Hi, and welcome to uh, How Ventilators Work. I'm Justin Mizoraka, um, Program Director for a Respiratory Therapy Program, um, Transport Therapist for um, quite a few years. Um, <clears throat> How you doing? I am uh, Justin Mizoraka. I am going to be doing this little lecture for you, how ventilators work. Um, I am a program director for a respiratory therapy program, associate's degree, and um, I also teach introduction to mechanical ventilation uh, for them. But I've been doing this lecture for quite some time now, or something similar to this one for quite some time. And uh, the beauty of it is it gives you a good idea of how ventilators are supposed to work. So when they're not doing what they're supposed to, you can uh, figure out how to um, adjust things and get them to work or and know when to uh, decommission it or send it down to biomed. All right, well, let's get going. Well, here's some uh, cool facts about ventilators. The uh, ventilators, uh, positive pressure ventilation has been around for quite a while, um, the, uh, late 1940s and uh, early 1950s. Some of the designs came out and they're pretty cool actually when you think of the technology back then what they're able to do um when you look at the emerson post-op vents or the uh the mork uh vent i believe that's how you say that the mork vent um it uh, was a single limb vent that was able to go underneath the bed and uh, manage a patient um without taking up too much space and that vent didn't have any alarms it didn't have um any um safety measures to it, anything. It's um, pretty rudimentary, but um, did the job that it needed to get done. So the uh, first generations of uh, ICU ventilators came out in the 1940s and 50s. It seems a lot later than what we would uh, um, guess that it did. Uh, that Mork ventilator is a single circuit, simple piston ventilator uh, that wasn't very complex at all. And it was designed to be placed under the patient's bed. Uh, it had no monitors, no alarms, no specific settings, nothing. Um, and that, uh, so you think of the safety features on there, they're pretty much the eyes of the provider. Um, and then you get down to, um, oh, sorry, uh, the Emerson. And when you're looking at the uh, Emerson, it was a little, it was a post-surgical vent. Remember these vents, they didn't have trigger capabilities on them, anything. They, uh, they, they also didn't have PEEP. So there was a big study that came out um, it, for, I'm going to mess up the guy's name, um, um, Asprall and uh, et al. And uh, they figured out peep if they put the expiratory limb underwater, you know, whatever centimeter depth underwater they put it, they would be able to generate positive end expiratory pressure inside that circuit. So the advances, I mean, this is 1970. Um, and you think of the timeline of where we are from the 1940s to the 1970s before they even figured out peeps, that's pretty impressive. Um, and then here we are when you're looking at the technology we have currently, it's absolutely amazing what we're able to do. So our ventilator is, um, we just called it a black box back in the day, the, uh, the uh, vent that was plugged into the outlet um for power and then a high pressure gas source and uh, the rt user would uh, look at the interface and uh will still do uh start that over <clears throat> so the black box this is uh, just referring to the ventilator and it's uh, plugged into an outlet for power um if you look on each um manual for a mechanical ventilation it'll, uh, ventilator it'll tell you the actual power source that you're able to use so some uh, ventil most ventilators are internationally um, usable, I guess. Uh, you can plug them into different sources and uh, All right, so the black box, what that is, is that it's pretty much the ventilator, right? That ventilator is plugged into an electrical outlet and the electrical outlet, um, uh, there's a variance on what that um, power source is able to accept. So remember, most of a lot of our ventilators are um, able to be used around the world. Um, they just have different power sources that they're uh, that are acceptable. Um, so there's a range in the manual that will tell you what it's able to accept and what it's not. Now, if it's a ventilator that's in the U.S. and it has a U.S. plug, well, that's more than likely 110 is what it's able to handle, right? Um, that was, that's going to power the uh, inter user interface. So all your values that you're able to see um, up on the screen, the digital stuff, 
um, that allows us to manage the vent. And uh, a control system uh, interprets the settings and produces and regulates the desired output. Uh, we also have gas sources that are hooked up to the wall. Remember, we used a 50 PSI um, hooked to the wall. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Our different power sources. Well, ventilators can, they don't necessarily have to have electric, but they do have to have some pneumatic component, uh, whether it's generated by electricity or you know, with a compressor or um, whether it's coming off of a wall or off of the tank. So um, electric, again, we're just plugging into the wall. Pneumatic, we have ventilators that can be run um, completely on pneumatic devices, but you, you're not gonna get a good user interface on that. Um, and then there's mixed. So most of the systems that are out there now are mixed. Uh, they're gonna be pneumatically powered. Um, so air and oxygen coming off the wall, or some of them are just oxygen, and then you have a compressor on the ventilator that um, allows uh, for a blending. And that is my computer telling me that I'm getting lots of announcements. Okay, let's see if we can get through this slide without uh, my computer sending me a message here. Um, power sources, um, that's electric, pneumatic, or mixed. So electric would be a power source that's plugged into the wall. Remember that 110 volt for uh, US. Um, pneumatic would be just um, gas sources. So uh, your air and O2, 50 PSI coming off the wall. Um, and then a mixed, that would be if you had, this most ventilators now, right, is the uh, uh, an electrical source. So you can see your user interface. Um, you can, um, the panel on the front that was uh, allowed, allows you to see things digitally. Um, and then, uh, you know, runs all your motherboards and the computer systems within the ventilator. And then the gas source is actually what's pushing the ventilator. But then we have ventilators that have compressors on them. So that's mixed, right? So it has a uh, um, electrical um for the uh, user interface, and it's also powering the compressor. And the compressor will able to, is able to build up a pressure, but then you have to bleed in oxygen. So you're gonna use two different sources of power, pneumatic and electric. But remember, there's uh, there are ventilators that are electric, pneumatic, or mixed. All right, our electrically powered systems. So we run uh, 110 to 115 volts using um, AC power. So there's a cool little uh, demonstration that I'll do in class with um, clean energy and dirty energy. So a sine wave and then a modified sine wave uh, electrical input. Those electrical inputs are based on like uh, the quality of the electricity coming in uh, and poor quality electrical activity coming in or poor quality um, voltage coming in could actually cause a like a heat, mostly heaters uh, on the ventilators to kick off or to kick back and pop a breaker. So you can lose that power source uh, because of the, the fluctuation of power. But uh, we also have batteries on there, right? So batteries are used as a backup. And then they're also used um, to, uh, for in-house transport or um, out of hospital transport as well. So good to know that both sources can be used. If you are using a regular ventilator and you lost power, you wanna make sure that you have a battery power backup to, um, to keep things going. If not, you're gonna be handbagging. Okay, we're getting to the fun stuff. Uh, pneumatic powered vents, um, and this could be also um, your mixed um, powered vents, uh, are gonna have two PSI sources, so typically air and oxygen. Um, you can actually plug other gas sources into the back of most ventilators, but uh, you'll have to look at your manual to see what yours will be able to take. Um, so use just oxygen, and then you have a built-in compressor into that ventilator that will bleed that um, oxygen in and uh, blend it all up and give you the desired FiO2 that you're uh, putting into the vent. Um, your pneumatic vents, you can, they can use uh, needle valves, venturian trainers, injectors, flexible diaphragms, spring-loaded valves uh, to make things happen. And uh, we'll go a little bit more into that a couple slides down. So fluidic ventilators rely on uh, special principles to control glass flow. And uh, that we're going to talk about the Coanda effects. And, uh, next slide, I've got a, or two slides down. I have a good, or next slide. I have a good picture of uh, uh, what it's going to look like. Um, some of the examples of those would be the MVP-10. And um, they also have an electrical source that helps to um, uh, energize the computer that controls ventilator functions. Um, I, I just attached a, um, a study from 1974 uh, was the evaluation of fluidic ventilator a new approach to mechanical ventilation 
actually really good uh interesting thought processes on there and, and, and neat to see what they were thinking of back in 1974 compared to what we're looking at now um, i always use nava as a good example of what we're um, in asv of what we're doing now so we have um, sensors that were sit by your um by your phrenic nerve to identify when your diaphragm is trying to trigger the ventilator and that is measured in millivolts and it'll trigger the vent um, instead of a, a slower process. So um, you think of where we are now compared to where we were with uh, fluidics, which is still a great design and we use it um, throughout all different types of industry and it works great, right? Um, but technology is advancing, right? So here's a neat little diagram as well as a uh, really cool video that uh, um, it's designed for kids so they can understand the Coando effect. So, you know, I'll be able to understand it. Um, so the basic of uh, fluidic devices um, used in several mechanical ventilators and also uh, several industries. So here's the confusing part about fluidics. We always think that has to be fluid. Well, it could be gases. Uh, they're going to work the same way as fluid would for the most part as we push that little pin you can see that little pin on this on the bottom picture of the slide it goes in and it changes the actual direction of flow by um and, and you when you watch a coanda effective video it'll make a lot more sense so when we think fluidics think coanda okay Negative pressure ventilator. Well, uh, how do we normally breathe when we're not on a ventilator? It's a negative pressure. Our diaphragm drops down, right? And then when it drops down, it creates a negative pressure when our, within our thoracic cavity, pulling in air from the outside. Um, so that's the most natural way for us to breathe. So uh, do you remember what this Frank Starling effect is? Well, I would click on the next slide and find out what the answer to that is because this is going to be on a test So let's look at this the easy way um, instead of all the calculations. Uh, we're going to improve venous return in negative pressure ventilation because what that's doing is it's a sucking blood from the great vessels back into the heart. If you it, if you have a good refill in the heart and you have a normal compression ratio in the heart, then you're able to eject more blood through the heart, uh, increasing blood pressure. So Frank Starling Law is telling you that your blood pressure should improve with negative pressure ventilation. Okay, like we were just talking about, um, during upright physical exercise, there is an increase in end diastolic volume due to the action of the peripheral muscle pump and increased venous tone. Um, so what this, what this is doing is you, your heart is filling up with a lot of blood, more so than before. If it's uh, filling up with more blood, then you're able to actually contract more blood, and there's a whole uh, big science behind that. We can get into that later. Um, and you're going to have a higher stroke volume. That higher stroke volume increases your blood pressure, which improves the patient's overall status.
So I'm sure by now you have done your reading in your textbook and you understand what transrespiratory pressure gradient is. So um, what it is, is the pressure at the airway opening minus the pressure at the body surface. Uh, we generate a large pressure at the opening of the airway and it's transmitted to the lower airways, but not all of it. Well, what happens to that? Well, when you go to take that breath in uh, through positive pressure, uh, what do we just do to the patient to be able to give them positive pressure? Well, we put an ET tube in there, which decreases the foramen size. Now the foramen size is um, more narrow, uh, so we have to increase the pressure to get the same volume in that we were trying to get in before. Uh, so that's where we end up getting in trouble. Some of the trouble that we get into is we have to have a higher pressure to get that same volume down into the patient's airway. So we're going to talk a whole lot more about that throughout this whole thing. So positive pressure ventilation, that's kind of the opposite of the Frank Starling law. Uh, those larger pressures in the endothoracic cavity are actually, you figure if you're hyper expanding your lungs or, or filling them up more, what are we surrounding? Well, we're surrounding the heart, right? And the, the heart's a really strong muscle. Uh, so we're not too worried about that. What we are worried about is what feeds that. And that's the inferior and superior vena cava. Those are fairly floppy blood vessels because they're veins, it's not, not, not arteries, right? So we can easily impede those. And if we impede, impede that blood flow to the heart to refill, now we don't have the same contractility because the heart is not filling up very well with blood. So it doesn't have the strength of contractility. It doesn't have the blood flow of volume coming into it. And therefore the cardiac output is going to be lower or stroke volume is going to be lower. So what is the control panel? The control panel is where we do all of our work. Uh, it's where all the buttons, knobs, dials, all that good stuff are. Plus, we get to see where the graphics are on, on this screen. That's a uh, servo U looking very fancy, a um, lot nicer than some of the old ventilators that us old timers uh, used back in the day. Uh, the servo B. What's the uh, servo B and servo C are the ones I used when I first started. So that control panel has everything that the RT is going to be managing on there. And again, just another view of a control panel, what uh, different ones will look like. You'll be able to see the buttons on the bottom or, um, you know, they're not really buttons, it's a touch screen. So you touch the screen, turn the dial, and you have to acknowledge again by either pushing that dial in or pressing the button again um, to uh, acknowledge it. We can't, we don't want to make sure that we're not pressing, uh, making a change and then not accepting it because it won't go through. Uh, we don't want to make any accidental um, changes either. Now, for those of you who like to actually pass my test, this is one of the questions I will put on there. I know for a fact it is on the test. A pneumatic circuit is what? Well, it's a series of tubes that allow gas uh, to flow inside the ventilator in between the vent and the patient. So pneumatic just means air, right? Um, that's what's going through the circuit. It's not only the one that's going from the wall to the to the ventilator it's not only the one that's going from the ventilator to the patient it includes both of them and then there's also pneumatic circuits within the ventilator as well an internal compressor why is that important well some hospitals may have problems with their compressed air um, they may not have compressed air um, and then the ventilator can actually kick up its compressor and generate a 50 psi air source to the ventilator to offer blending. So you would have a 50 PSI source for oxygen and then a 50 PSI source for um, air that's allowed to bleed in to decrease the FiO2 by adding air because the air is 21. Um, out of the wall, oxygen is 100%. So you bleed those two together and you'll have a decrease in FiO2. And if you think about it, a, a close to 50 50 distribution will be about 60% FiO2 on the ventilator that will pull about the same amount of flow from each one of those at the same time. Okay, now they're back to the functionality of the ventilator, the externally compressed 50 PSI source. Remember that it's 50 PSI plus or minus five is typically what we're shooting for, um, for the ventilator to receive or a blender to receive. And you'll see that more in your Perry class where we use a blender on the wall. And that will not accept a pressure source greater than 55 or lower than 45. So it will, it might, it'll accept it, but it will only take the lower of the, the, uh, the pressure. So we don't end up injuring anybody. 
The internal compressor is there. We just talked about that to generate a, a, a flow of air to the patient. Um, most ICU vents are single circuit ventilators, allowing the gas to go from the wall through the vent into the patient. And a double circuit vent uses a bellows or a bag and chamber. And we're going to talk about that. So don't get all worried. And hopefully you read about that in your textbook, because I will ask you a question about that. So take a look at the lines on the glass um, cylinder part, uh, the top of the, that little ventilator, the bellows. Um, what that is, is markers for volume. So they're separated typically in 100 uh, milliliter increments. As the bellows goes up, it pulls air into there. And then as it pushes back down, that's what pushes through the circuit and gives the patient a volume. So remember, they're pushing a volume, and that volume is going to generate a pressure within the patient's lungs based on resistance and compliance. So the compressor uses fan blades to pull the air in. A piston will, can also be used to pull the air in. Um, when you start to look at the um, whether it's water-cooled or um, air-cooled, a water-cooled is going to be a little bit more efficient or a lot more efficient. Um, and it's good, probably going to be quieter as well. You're not sucking in a whole bunch of um, extra air to blow by the system. Um, the more expensive ones will be a water-cooled system. And there's three different types of um, water-cooled systems as well. Uh, there's um, open system with, without circulating water, open system with circulating water, and then closed system with circulating water. And uh, uh, those would obviously need a water the uh, open system with the uh, circulating water would need uh, water supply So really not too long ago, we were using um, this type of volume displacement in uh, Servo 900C. So I stopped using those back in 2000. Um, and then they came out with the Servo 300, which was a uh, microprocessor um, compu uh, computer pretty much running the rest of the ventilator. Um, the That volume displacement is pretty cool using a, uh, um, a piston that's pulling the air in and then uh, a bellows which would deliver a set volume so if you are a car person or a mechanic or anything like that this stuff is going to make a lot of sense to you there's two different types of pistons um, they're linear driven which you can see is on a little ratcheting system and that ratcheting system will pull backwards and go forward and allow the um the compression to occur. When it comes backwards, it pulls air in. When it goes forward, it's pushing the air out to the patient on a time cycle. Um, or um, yeah, back then it was all on time cycle. And then the rotary driven one is um, like a Mazda, uh, a cyclical engine. So that is going to cycle through. And as it goes around the circle, it's pulling back as it's in the furthest section, all the way to the left, would be all the way back, pulling air in to the inlet valve and then there's a check valve that doesn't let it go back out through that section it only allows it to go to the the patient side and as it comes back around and pushes it'll push that volume in there and then you could set if you think of the, where that circle is the rotary um if the distance back from there would be what would allow the uh, the variation in volume our uh, current icu ventilators are using uh, flow control valves to regulate uh, flow to the patient and they operate by opening and closing um, either completely or small increments that are very defined in the amount of pressure or volume that they're pushing through. So take a look at page 55 in your textbook, Pill, um, pill Beams, and you'll see that um, uh, more definition about those. Um, they're typically in a, uh, they used to be a manual, but uh, they're an electrical circuit that you turn, uh, either press a button, turn a dial, and it will actually adjust that flow control valve and um, for a very specific 